So today I'm going to show you something really interesting. This is um, an idea I had quite some time ago, but I didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle together to really show you what I mean. And now I have all the pieces of the puzzle. So here on the left, you will see, um, well, actually the left and the right are the same picture. And uh, what, what I'm depicting here are the um, isopotentials around uh, a spherical magnet, uh, this was generated using uh, Michael Snyder's, uh, the 3D version of his software. Really though, I'm, I'm only generating like one slice. I'm only using one slice from the middle, just because you can really on a 2D screen only show one slice at a time. And I'm actually more interested in this uh, middle slice here. And really, so what I'm showing here are the uh, isopotentials. I'm rendering them slightly different than the way Michael um, displays them in his software. And so really, um, this is, you can see with the software that there's a gradient. You can see that the isopotentials are really a smooth gradient, but the way I'm rendering it, I'm doing it in a way to, to enhance the certain isopotentials. But really, this is just a smooth gradient from out here to in the middle. So really, it's a smooth gradient, but I'm using a, um, a different rendering technique to enhance the ice potential. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. So what I've implemented here is, um, you'll see it on the right here, is I've implemented a little like test magnet. So I'm using a little test magnet to, um, to, to show you how a magnet, a little magnet will align itself uh, with respect to the magnet and the isopotentials. And so here you can see that the, the magnet is lining up uh, such that the inertial plane is, um, is along the isopotential line and the magnet is pointing 90 degrees orthogonal to the isopotential lines the isopotential curves. Of course these are curves and they're not real they're not lines they're curves and they're not curves, they're surfaces, but because I'm only showing you a single slice through a three-dimensional space, uh, you're just seeing the, a two-dimensional curve of the three-dimensional or, or two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional isopotential surface. So this is a surface, which when you intersect it, you get a curve and you can see the magnet always lines up with um, orthogonal to exactly 90 degrees orthogonal to the isopotential gradient. Now you can see this is a gradient and now it's clear to see why the magnet lines up this way because that's the way the gradient goes. The gradient gets stronger and stronger and stronger as you move towards um, the magnet. And so what I'm mimicking here is this is the North Pole Okay, this is the North Pole. And so um, up is north, down is south, and blue is north, sorry, blue is south and red is north in my little tiny magnet here. Now, if I go down here, you'll see it points the opposite way. It does the same thing. It lines up with the isopotentials. Um, but um, now the, uh, and so this is a fairly coarse, I just wanted to point out, you can see this is fairly pixelated. This is a fairly coarse um, gradient. Uh, the resolution is not very high. And so sometimes the magnet doesn't line up perfectly, but uh, you can see that in general, it lines up orthogonal to, so, uh, to the isopotentials. Okay, that's what it's doing. So uh, this is really just a crude first approximation to simulating how a real how a magnet a small magnet will behave around a big magnet and you know in the past i've done experiments like this where i showed you that if when i place a magnet far away so when i place a small magnet far away from a big magnet and you will see that it will line up um, along the isopotential and point towards the magnet okay so that's what i'm i'm showing here and you can see that it works very nicely. So this is the North Pole. This is the South Pole. Okay. And if you go over here, you will see 
that it lines up. So I, you know that when you put a magnet, a small magnet or any magnet beside a magnet, so this is the dielectric inertial plane here. This is north, this is south, and if you put a magnet beside it, south is going to point up and north is going to point down. So this uh, mimics that, it mimics all the behaviors of the magnet um, fairly nicely. Again, this is just a crude first approximation. I have some ideas as to how to uh, improve this, but this is really good enough to show you the idea. This is actually closer to a sim, because I'm using the actual data, the raw data that Michael generates in his uh, program, um, I'm able to actually do a simulation. So this is closer to a simulation than it is just an animation. This is not an animation anymore. This is a simulation. I'm using uh, the data that Michael generated to make this picture so that you can see the, you know, the ice potentials. You can also see that the ice potentials are getting closer and closer together as you get closer to the magnet. And now you can see uh, I can um, simulate how a small magnet will orient itself around the big magnet. And you'll see something interesting here um, where really, in a way, I'm looking at I'm looking at a slice through the magnet. So it's kind of like saying I'm looking inside the magnet. And so you can see here, if I could actually go inside a magnet, I believe this is how it would behave. So you can see the North Pole is actually right here. It's right in, in here in the magnet. And you can see that my simulator with the isopotentials that are generated from Michael software are causing the magnet to behave this way. So this is interesting. Um, there's no way to actually test the inside of a magnet, at least I don't think so, um, especially a permanent magnet, which is a solid object. Um, I have a feeling though that if we did, if we, um, if we did this with a um, coil magnet that we would find this behavior. So you can see down here as well, right? You see that um, the south pole is right here and that the north pole of the tiny magnet is always pointing to that, um, that point, okay? So that's uh, number one of what I wanted to show you, but that's not all of what I want to show you. I want to actually bring in the Mendelbrot set and I want to show you how the gradient generated by the Mendelbrot set behaves very much like uh, a magnet, which is why I'm calling this video the a magnet as a, um, sorry, the Mendelbrot set as a quasi magnet. So let me set that up for you and then I will, uh, I will show you what I mean. Okay, so here we have, instead of the isopotentials of the magnet from, from Michael Snyder's software, I've got the isopotentials of the Mendelbrot set as I generate them in my software. And so um, these, these lines here, these are isopotential lines. It's a slightly different rendering than I did for the magnet, but really I just want to show that here you've got isopotential, um, you have an isopotential gradient. And what I'm going to show you here is I'm doing exactly the same thing uh, as I did with the magnet in that I'm using the gradient of that the, the uh, Mendelbrot algorithm generates. I'm using the gradient to uh, determine the orientation of the tiny magnet. So now I'm pretending that this is the magnet, that these are the isopotentials, and you will see that the <clears throat> magnet always lines itself up um, orthogonal to 90 degrees orthogonal to exactly orthogonal to the um, the gradient the the uh, Mendelbrot set gradient. Okay, you can see that it always points in um, it always points normal to the gradient. And so, of course, with the Mendelbrot set, the gradient is kind of a funny shape. And so as you go in here, you will see um, that it is, in fact, following the gradient. Um, now, the gradient is, in fact, a smooth gradient in the Mendelbrot set. I'm just generating um, generating a coarse gradient so that you can see, you know, when, when I line up with the, um, 
the ice potential that it is in fact lining up normal to the gradient, normal to the isopotential, which uh, is a curve. Okay, so um, I find this really interesting. So in my model, I'm, this is the South Pole. Okay, this is the North Pole. You can see that the magnet, the tiny magnet points to um, the blue points down. So this is the North Pole. And over here, the red points up. And this means that this is the South Pole. So, um, of course, the metal brought set is not exactly a magnet because I don't believe that the magnet looks, obviously the magnet doesn't look like this or the magnetic field doesn't look like this. But uh, that's why I call the Mendelbrot set a quasi-magnet um, because it's not an actual magnet. Just like in my paper, the Mendelbrot set as a quasi-black hole. Of course, it is not exactly a black hole, but it has a lot of the behaviors of, it has a lot of the, um, yeah, it has a lot of the behaviors of a black hole in that it's got a central converging region, it's got an outer diverging region, and it's got an event horizon. And so this fits in nicely with my, you know, the idea, I'm not going to say my idea, with the idea, okay, with the idea that a magnet is a black hole, okay, a magnet is, is a black hole. And so, um, it makes sense because we know that black holes have huge magnetic fields. And of course, only magnets can have magnetic fields. So it seems self-evident to me that black holes are in fact um, giant magnets. They are uh, functionally equivalent to a uh, giant magnet. Strong gravity is magnetism in disguise, in my opinion. So black holes are associated with strong gravity, strong gravity, um, strong gravity, is um, for all intents and purposes a magnetic field. So uh, it is coherent um, gravity. So strong gravity is coherent gravity and magnetism is coherent um, gravity. And we're sorry, probably better to say that uh, gravity is incoherent magnetism. Okay, so in, in black hole physics, you have gravity and you have strong gravity. And, and at our scale, we have gravity and we have magnetism. And I'm saying that, you know, strong gravity and magnetism are functionally identical to each other. So um, getting back to the image of a magnet and uh, the, the software that is used to generate the isopotentials, what I want to do is I want to um, show you, this is an image that I put on my community section fairly recently, and you can see that here is the image of a ferrous cell. This is the dielectric inertial plane here, and this is the image from the software, and I'm going to overlay them for you so you can see that it is a very good match. Okay, it's a very good match, and so that is why I am claiming that the uh, ferrocell is showing the isopotentials, at least in this view, in this dielectric view, what happens when you view the north and south pole, I believe are, are, it's a completely different circumstance. And I think this is the more natural view of the magnet um, because the light source is coming from the outside in. I think, you know, the what is depicted in the ferrocell is extreme, is... Um, dependent on the light source. So you change the light source and you're going to be changing what the ferrous cell sees. And so when you look at the North Pole and you see the, um, the curved lines that seem to spiral into the, um, the magnet, uh, that, is, that is an artifact of the light sources and the view of the magnet. And so um, I just want to show you one more thing um, regarding the the black hole. So here is an image I found of a simulation of uh, a black hole. And um, please don't tell me that black holes don't exist, okay? The phenomenon that we call black hole exists. There is something at the center of the galaxy that we call black, black hole. Um, these simulations are really interesting, and I think 
that um, when you see when you match um, when you match the isopotentials of the magnet when you map that onto the black hole you can see it's also a pretty good fit um, which is why I'm saying uh, claiming that a black hole is functionally I identical to a giant magnet strong gravity is magnetism in disguise and you know weak gravity is what we have you know our normal experience of but there you can see you know the um, the isopotentials of this side view of the magnet is very similar to what you're seeing in this simulation of a black hole okay not exactly the same okay that's why this is where the fractal paradigm comes in because people confuse uh, the term self-similarity with self self um, sameness okay um, things at different skills aren't scales aren't exactly the same when you zoom into the Mendelbrot set you don't see the same Mendelbrot set you see a uh, different one you see similar shapes you see a similar shape but the outer boundary the outer conditions are slightly different and so um, I'm just saying that a black hole is self similar to a magnet and I just want to show you something quickly here um, this is the image of an electron okay this was taken you know this is I, I took this snapshot from a video that I found and I think I've showed you guys this, this before so I won't, won't get into it but uh, if you look up you know the first picture of an electron you're going to find this image and um, this is actually taken from Michael Snyder's software and again this is another view of a magnet um, and you can see that it is very similar to uh, this supposedly picture of um, of an electron and you can kind of see the isopotentials here and so and that's the whole point of self-similarity the electron is an atom is a cell is um, is a planet is a Sun is a solar system is a galaxy is a black hole so all these things are related they're not exactly the same but there is a there does seem to be a self-similarity that ties all of this together and so um, that is all I'm going to say for now this was just a quick video I wanted to throw out there to show you guys what I'm up to and what I'm thinking so I hope you're having a great day and um, I'll be back